Hey, what's up gardening friends? Jeff here, how's everybody doing? Hope you're doing well. I'm, I'm fantastic. Just hanging outside with a couple of really, really nasty looking calatheas. Imagine how beautiful this would be. The golden hour, the sun coming through just perfectly on the plant. <laughs> Only the plant just didn't look like total garbage right now, but that's okay. That's the point of the video. Partially an update video because this was a thing that happened in some time ago, a video some months ago, where I got these calatheas here and I moved them into these self-watering containers. So here's just the update. They did fine. The way they look right now has nothing to do with the self-watering containers. We'll talk about what's what's going on up here and try and get these looking better into some new pots. We can just go over all of the things. So yeah, there's a fair amount to talk about. A quick background on the plants. Here is a calathea yellow fusion. Beautiful plant. And then this one over here that it's, it looks better from the top. I mean, kind of. This is a white star peacock, I think. I'm pretty sure that's what this was. Yeah, rare white star peacock. That's what it says. Rare, I'm sure. Very rare plant that I see all over the place at all the nurseries. And then the containers are just self-watering containers that I got from... Why is this? Why are these moving? What's happening? What's going on over here? Oh, oh, what are you doing? What you doing? You're not supposed... What did you just eat? The containers. That was a big part of a video with these self-watering containers as figured with calatheas, an easier route to go. And it was, they've been, they don't look like this because the containers, like I said, they've been growing pretty flawlessly. Haven't had to do much with them. I like these self-watering containers with the exception of the fact that they're clear, which I thought was going to be something that I would just love about them because then I could see if they had enough water in them. But the water just always looked mucky because it's flushing through soil right so it's it's not going to look great when it gets down in there i'm going to put some carbon charcoal that's been rinsed really well at the bottom maybe that would have helped clear that out or down in the reservoir doesn't really matter this comes with an option where you can have these tinted as well other thing i really enjoyed with these is that they have an opening here they have a lip so it's easy to refill them from the bottom and also the water won't overflow so there's a way if you put too much water in it can get out from right there. I like that. It's easy to go overboard with the self-watering containers, or I should say it's easy to have difficulties with the self-watering containers if there's not some sort of an outlet or a viewing window, some way to know if there's too much water in there. You don't want the water up actually around the roots. The point is to just have a wick that will draw the water back up to the plant. Minimize a lot of issues with root rot just by having a hole drilled somewhere for water to escape. We'll get to all that because I'm going to be moving these into much larger self hoarding containers, much larger. I also just realized these kind of look like trash cans, don't they? Eh, that's fine. And now you might be wondering, hey, why do these look like complete and total garbage? Especially if you're talking about how these self watering containers were working out for them. But it's, it, was, it was hot. July was extremely hot and dry, which that's not a Calathea's jam. I also pushed these two specifically. I had a few other plants and self-watering containers, but these two, I really pushed the limits with these to see how much light they could actually take when they're outdoors. Oftentimes I found that plants can usually take a lot more light than we say that they can, and so I just, I wanted to know. And to my surprise, I had these sitting over here, over here, in front of those two blue pots where they were getting direct morning sun just for, I don't know, maybe an hour or two back there and then it was filtered throughout the rest of the day. Still very surprised that they could take any direct sun at all without scorch. Maybe I shouldn't say without scorch because I mean look at them. The scorch on the leaves, the crispiness and all that started around early to mid July when we were having the triple digit temps and very 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 dry air which we don't normally have here so I'm a noob to gardening with high heat and low humidity. Here's how that went. Could have been worse, really, considering I went ahead and I just let them keep taking all the sun that they were getting. What are you doing over there, Turbo? Turbo, what you doing, baby? Point being, I know they don't look great, but I'm actually surprised that they're alive at all. The Yellow Fusion, there was a day where I think it was like 108. When that happened, I did give that a scoot back into some more shade because I was like, I just, I didn't want to lose the plant. I really like it. The other, well, I'm not, I don't know, I'm not really attached to this one, but I really do enjoy this Calathea because it just, look at the variation on it. Isn't it just beautiful? 
it's a neat looking plant. You can get these moved into some larger containers. This is a heck of an upgrade. That should be more than enough for them. Get all the dead stuff cleaned off. Give them a nice reset. Give them a chance to spring back. I also need to put down some slug and snail bait. That's, there's holes in all these leaves. And that's mostly from snails. I haven't seen any thrips on these. I have had some issues with whitefly on this one. I don't know why they just really seem to enjoy it. So it's been getting sprayed with insecticidal soap and or neem, just whatever I have closest. That's what I've been spraying it with. And I like having a small container for that because I can just tip it and get the inside of the leaves a lot more easily <laughs> Well, More easily. It's the end of the day. I need to learn not to film at the end of the day. It's when the brain stops working for filming videos. And then on this one over here, the issues have mostly just been snails. Pulling snails off this thing all the time. It's sitting in a reservoir of water. That's not terribly surprising. And that corner over there, there's a fountain. Just a lot of snail action. So I may end up moving these somewhere else to an area where there aren't as many snails, or I could, I just need to get on top of the slug and snail bait. Put some of that down. You can see it's already pushing out new growth. So a lot of the old crispy, burnt up July foliage that will hopefully be gone in a few weeks. Really on that note, we can start getting these cleaned up moved into these larger containers, which I've never used these before. The ones that look like trash cans, so that should be interesting. I might drill out here with me in case I'm gonna pop some holes in which I have a feeling I'm going to need to do. Oh, this also had a reservoir on it, but it kept falling off when I was trying to pick it up with one hand and I figured you, you get the point with this one. You didn't need to see them both. Pull this one in here and start cutting out all that dead stuff. So disappointing when you see that, but I'm not all that discouraged because at least it's not full of bugs. I'd rather have to deal with just burnt leaves and drought damage on a plant and dealing with an insect infestation. I might be speaking too soon. I haven't actually gotten in there all the way, but for the most part, I haven't been seeing anything in there other than, like I said, some snails here and there, but that's an easy enough thing to fix. And this is an easy plant to clean up too. I appreciate the plants where the old stuff just snaps right off. You don't even have to go with clippers. If the damage on this one were a lot worse. I mean, this isn't great. There's lots of new stuff already starting to pop out. If that weren't the case, then I would really just cut this whole thing back to just, you know, being some green nubs above the soil and just let it regrow from the rhizomes down below. I don't know if that's a tactic I would use with all Calathea, but this one, this yellow fusion has been a pretty vigorous grower. I mean, you saw the, the I mean, this whole pile of junk over here, right? And it's already flushing out with all this new stuff. I don't think that if I were to cut this back heavily that it would be all that detrimental to the plant. It really should just get it to push out stronger roots and give it a nice new start. It would also require a lot more patience. Just when I thought I was done, I give it a turn and I see more crummy looking leaves. I'm not gonna be taking off all of the leaves that have damage on them. I figure if they're about 50% still green, then they can stay because there's still chlorophyll in there that's still going to add to the plant's ability to grow. But then like something like this, where it's mostly white and half of the leaf is missing, that can go. I don't see a reason to keep that one. All right, that's looking much better, isn't it? You can also see where the plant was up against the blue pots, right? See how it's leaning out? And that's with the direct sun in the morning. Like I said, it's only an hour to an hour and a half, two at the most earlier in the season, the sun shifts. You know, as the season progresses and starts to get more shade. But still, that much direct sun still having a lean there, I'm surprised by that. I would imagine if I were to put this in more sun, it would probably be okay, just as long as it's not, you know, 108 degrees outside with 20% with humidity. That was almost the kiss of death for both of these plants. All right, so now that that's done, I'm gonna go ahead and get that one cleaned up and move on to something more exciting, like checking out these pots, seeing if they're any good. Wouldn't be one of my videos if there wasn't some kind of ridiculous abrupt change, would it? Yes, welcome to my channel. Things happen here. The, it, there were spider mites. Another thing I've never had to deal with with outdoor plants, it tends to be humid here and breezy, so spider mites, not an issue during the summertime. I've only ever had to deal with them in the winter. But this year, July, like I mentioned, was very hot and very dry. So I did have some spider mite infestations, mostly in my colocasias. And with those, I just cut the foliage off and threw it away and did some insecticidal soap spraying. I was going to just toss this one because I have a lot of plants. And if I'm not really attached to a plant and it's gonna be a pain in the butt, then it's gotta go. I don't have time for anything that's high maintenance if I don't absolutely Love it. And I don't absolutely love this plant. However, I was thinking about it and it's been sitting right next to this one all spring, all summer, and it has just been a magnet for bugs. But this one, the yellow fusion, 
nothing. No problems at all. Never seen a bug on it, other than the occasional snail here and there, hence the snail holes in the tops of the leaves. My thinking here with keeping the plant is that potentially I haven't had any issues with the yellow fusion because they prefer this one. So I should hold on to it, keep them right next to each other. Let the bugs have the plant I don't care about, and then the one over here can just flourish, other than some snails. I sprayed it heavily, the tops and bottoms of the leaves flush the soil out. It's gonna hang out here in this plastic bag for a few days to make sure that all that insecticidal soap that's in there, or neem. I use neem on this one. What are you barking at? That way it can just kind of marinate. The neem with calatheas, sometimes I've found that it can burn the leaves up, but like I said, I don't really care that much about this one, so just burn away. It's fine, not the end of the world. It's being treated, being handled. Self-watering trash cans. With these, I think there's some assembly required. They didn't come with any instructions at all. For the simple types, that's not, all that unusual. Normally fairly easy to figure these things out. Came with a card, nothing important on there, and three wicks. A wick to go inside of each one of those, these, inside there. Not certain where the wick is supposed to go. I would imagine probably through here where there's kind of a hole drip. There's not a, that's not a hole. I pulled up the Amazon listing. It's the closest thing I can find to a description and it has this picture here of the wick going through the slit in the side of that little funnel and then out the bottom. Which I find interesting since they didn't drill out the hole in there. I brought the drill out with me because I wanted to drill a hole in the side of this too. I'll explain that when I get there. It's pretty cheap plastic, so it doesn't take long to drill a hole. I don't, how's that gonna go in there? That's not big enough. As my next size up is so big and out of focus, you get the point. Concern is that if it's too big, the rope, that wicking cord is just gonna fall right out of there. Although I think it's, it'll be wedged in through that side piece, won't it? All right, so getting the wick to go through there like that. And then there's a slit right here that this is supposed to somehow go through. I bet it needs to go through that first. It has an indentation that goes inward. Am I gonna need some kind of tool for this? I don't think I can do that with my fingers. Maybe if you push really hard, apply some pressure, then that kind of opens it up enough. Maybe get in there and pull it through. Yes, maybe, think so. Okay, this is, I've been working on this for a while. Having trouble getting that to come out that bottom hole. Got, probably not gonna be able to see it, but there's just a tiny bit that I think I can, there we go. Okay, that was unnecessarily complicated. Maybe it didn't have to be, I don't know, there weren't any instructions. Although to be fair, if there were instructions, I probably wouldn't have read them. These do have a viewing window on them, so you can see if there's enough water in there. I have noticed that there's a big gap between the bottom of the container right here and the top of that viewing window, like probably that much. It has something to do with this cone down here. How does that work? If the root mass is all the way up here, what's the point, what's that all about? Shouldn't the wicking cord be coming up into this area? Wouldn't you think? I don't know, I have no clue. Time will tell. It does have a spot up here in the top to refill, to add water down there into the reservoir, where it apparently wants the water to be much lower. Not much, but probably an inch lower than the bottom of the container here. I suppose that's fine. It's just, it's like that wicking cord is supposed to be coming up higher. It's all right. Need to get over that and trust them. I am going to drill a hole in the side of the pot, which I know aesthetically isn't gonna look that great. The reason I do that is because when the plants are outside, it rains a lot and the water could fill this up like a bucket. So by having a small hole drilled in the other side that's just right above, right there, it'll make sure that the water level doesn't get so high in here that the plants are just sitting in water all the time because you know, then they would die. Don't want that to happen. Fill this up with some all-purpose potting mix that I have added some earthworm castings to. Drains freely. It's a nice airy mix that also holds on to a good amount of moisture. It's the exact same mix that they were in in those other containers and they seem to enjoy it. The name broke. Don't fix it. Plant seemed good with this mix before. And now what I'm really curious about is to see what's going on with the roots of this one. I have a feeling, just a sneaking suspicion that there's probably going to be some critters in here around those roots. Mostly I would think millipedes, maybe snails, slugs, hopefully not centipedes. There it is. A, really? Another plane? Come on. Looks pretty good. I'm not seeing any bugs. Went in, loosened it up. I can take the old wicking cord out of there. Get it centered, get it backfilled. Oh, I also, I need to mention the potting soil. It's just, it's sopping wet right now. It's been raining and the spot where I thought it was covered and protected turned out it wasn't. So 
it's looking extra mucky and muddy, but it still crumbles nicely. As long as water moves through it quickly, it's totally fine. We'll probably top dress this with some sand, pull it out and give it a heavy water so that that can flush through. Talked about that when I was repotting my bipinate ethidum. Mm, I think that was just last week. I'd like for the potting mix to have some more coarse material and there's some grit. Pretty easy. This is one of those pots where every single speck of dirt shows on the side of it. After seeing those roots, I would say that this repot was this, this is a smidge premature. Probably didn't need it quite yet. There was still room for the roots to expand out in that other container. With the time of year, we still have several weeks of nice, warm, humid weather. I wanted to go ahead and get it bumped up into something where it can go ahead and spend some time to fill out the container and then get more growth pushed out before it has to go inside. I keep getting paranoid about the spider mites, but so far, not looking like a problem on this one. Oh, and I had been fertilizing these every single week with quarter strength all-purpose fertilizer. Nothing special. There's organic materials in that potting mix. I think there's alfalfa meal, yucca root extract, feather meal, and I added earthworm castings. And the mix already has earthworm castings in it. So it's just a spoma potting mix. And that's going to do... Has that been in frame this whole time? I cleaned the table off. Cleaned the table off and put the the things in the chair that were on the table, you know, normal outdoor things, curry comb, coconut oil, swim fins, wire, piece of a palm tree, date night stuff. Tried to make it look clean. Hopefully it was. Hope everybody's doing well. Comment down below, say hi. There's the update on the Calatheas and these new self-watering containers that I'm, eh, I'm on the fence about them. I think the wicking system in them seems off. Not particularly fond of it, but we will see what happens with them. This is a good time to get them moved over into this because I can have them outside where they're going to be near my misters and they'll have much better hydration right now than they will when they get moved inside. Um, the other reason I want to be meant to talk about this is also because I wanted some more surface area up top so that I can put a hefty layer of some coarse material down. Usually I'll use, I want to say it's turfus. It's not turfus. It's like hydrostone pumice. That's all it is. It's just pumice. I've noticed that having a good layer of that on top of the soil does help with the slugs and snails. It seems to like it tears them up as they crawl across it trying to get to the plants. Morbid, but effective. Okay, as always, and most importantly, everybody. Keep on growing. Bye-bye.